Welcome, everybody. My name is John. I'm a recovered alcoholic and drug addict. Great to be here. And I chose to choose choices today. And I just want to share about how that has uh, really come into light in my own recovery and really showing me the powerless, the powerlessness that I have, which produces a certain type of hopelessness to be able to put my hope in um, the power of God in my life. And so I would, I just want to start off by uh, just asking you the question, what do you hide? And, and I know that there are one or two of you right now that are debating what hiding is and what hiding isn't. Like, if you just don't tell somebody, is that hiding? Well, I think hiding is, withholding is a, a, a slight uh, form of hiding. And so what do you hide? In my, in my household, I have a brilliant, like almost borderline, you know when somebody's so smart, they become institutionalized, like they should be captured and put in prison, you know, like some of those superheroes? Well, the other adult in my house is like that. And she has found, she, she finds that the other people in the household consume things at an improper rate. And so she has oftentimes hidden things. She hides things. <laughs> I'm like, the other day there was some, I was like, man, where did, where did those Nana cookies go? Like, I just want a cookie. And I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to like, where, where could they be? And I don't want to be that guy that's frantically looking. Um, and I, I finally, I, I found, I was told that they were in the freezer and I'm like, what better put, and, and some of the things that have been hidden, I'm like, you're a genius. Like, why can't I think to do that? Why, why can't I think to like see in the future and go like, this is all going to be consumed because it's on the counter. Why don't I just put some over here uh, for safekeeping so that the others just won't make themselves sick. Um, so, so that happens a little bit in my house and it's uh, kind of funny. But I'm, I, I, I haven't figured that part out yet, but I have figured out hiding things. Um, what do you hide? Uh, what is the first time that you can remember hiding something, hiding a behavior, hiding, hiding uh, a food, um, not telling uh, somebody something that you should probably tell them, uh, leaving out information, withholding information, all of those things. Um, I, I, I can think about hiding alcohol consumption. If you've ever been pulled over by the, by the police, um, and they ask, uh, okay, I'll use me. I, I have been pulled over by the police on a few occasions, never when, never in the last 18 years for some odd reason. And uh, you go through these ride programs and they always ask you the same thing. Have you had anything to drink? My answer, if I'm drinking, I would always lie. I would always say, yeah, I had one drink at the pub. Um, but I'm trying to cover something up. I don't want to get caught, so I minimize. That's a form of hiding. Or, or what if I have a motive that isn't necessarily good? I don't tell everybody that motive. Or what if you're somebody that struggles with lust? It, we hide that in the dark corners of our minds. Um, we can hide in public. We can hide in a club. I used to go on these, these road trips. Um, these adventures. Okay, scrap all those words. Uh, we call them benders. I would go on these benders and I would try not to get found. And um, if you live with somebody else, they want to find you. And it's kind of like this hide and seek now that I look back on it. And I don't want to get fined because I'm not in the right condition to be found. I don't want to be found. I don't want to be seen. I am, I am filled with the consumption of drugs and alcohol. And that demands me not to be functional in a, in a family dynamic. So I'm trying to hide. How about plagiarization? And how about the onset of AI? Has anybody used AI chat GTP to create um, a little blurb <laughs> or or like a poem or like an essay 
or a book review. I'm just thinking of all the times that I've used it. It's genius. It's way smarter than I am and probably will ever be. Like we do some ad set stuff and I give it the gist of it and it comes out with stuff that you would never even think of. It's brilliant, but I can hide behind that because it's not really me. So that's a form of hiding. I hide the fact that I'm hurt. I've, I hide the fact that I'm mad. I can hide the fact that I'm not satisfied. I'm irritated. I'm restless. I'm, I'm, I'm got these exaggerated thirsts and desires. What do we hide? What are we hiding? What are we hiding from? What's causing me to hide? Well, when we look back, um, I, I can think of, um, a dog that hides. Um, if you have a dog and it does a little job where it's not supposed to do a job and you get a little bit upset, it like cowers and runs away, tucks its tail. And I feel like that's my inner self when I'm hiding. I don't want to be seen for somebody that I might not want to be seen as. Like when I'm going through the, the drawer where I saw the cookies and now I'm like, man, no one ate those three cookies. Like they're probably hidden. Like somebody like is messing with me. So I'm going through them and the family's in the other room. And I don't really want to cause a commotion because I could be accused of being a cookie crackhead or whatever. Like I'm starting to get frantic. I'm looking in places and, and, and I don't want to be heard, but what am I actually hiding? I'm hiding an exaggerated need. Um, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to be judged. I want. I don't want to be criticized. I don't want to be found out. Uh, we see the the story that happened in the garden in the the first recorded uh, history of man, where um, they they the, there was fear that came in. It was a garden that God created for 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 God and man and woman to to cohabitate in in a garden of safety and provision and love and and they they had uh, full authority in there and then fear came in and and fear convinced them and and fear came in in the form of a serpent and it convinced them of something that they chose and out of their choice because we all have the ability to choose. And I'm going to contradict this, um, hopefully later in, in my talk, because I think that we think that we have a lot more choices than we actually do. So there was a presentation and then a choice was made or a choice was made and there was consequences to that choice. Um, the choice was basically to be independent uh, from the relationship that they had with God. They disobeyed. And so that caused the separation from God. And so what did they hit? Every bad choice causes me to hide. And so they hid on God, on God the creator, on God where there was all creation that was spoken out of his mouth and the universe was created. He is everywhere. He is inside of us. He is the rebar that holds us together. And yet they hid. He knows everything. He He's outside of time, creation, space, and matter. And yet they hid. They knew God probably more personally. Well, some of you are, I can tell that they, you know God like you're almost BFFs. But um, Adam and Eve would have a different, maybe a little bit different relationship than most of us with God. And yet, out of their choice, they chose to hide from God. And so here they are hiding in the garden, not wanting to be seen, not wanting to get in trouble or deal with the consequences. And, and they realized something very quickly that they were naked. They were vulnerable. They were exposed and they wanted to hide their shame. And so they took 
these big leaves and they were like, I don't know if they tested the leaves out first because the leaves that they picked were kind of prickly, like they were fuzzy. They took these fig leaves and they wove them together and they decided to make clothing and they hid in the forest or the rainforest or wherever they hid. And, and God came and said, hey, man, we got a little game of hide and seek. Imagine playing hide and seek with God. 100% of the time you're going to lose. Like 100% of the time. Half of the time we can't even find God when he's like right in front of us. So that's not a good game to play with God. Hide and seek, you will never win. You will always lose. And and so they hid from God and God was like, hey guys, we got a little hide and seek. Where are you? And, and because of their seeing themselves exposed and the choice that they made of independence, and they realize the severity of their, their actions, they decide to cover up and hide. And so just like you and me do that, we don't want to be seen a certain way by certain people. So we restrain ourselves from doing what we really want to do. And, and if, if you want me to prove that, just go into any church and talk the way that you do to certain people in your, um, in your, in your, in, in your life. Um, all of a sudden you don't swear. All of a sudden you say amen and glory and you don't talk about the show that you were watching and you're probably not going to be forthright with your, um, um, your, 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 what, what's that called? Your, your health on your phone. You know, those like the, the, the checkup, the, the, the optimization of like, hey, you've been on your phone for like 18 hours this day. Um, you're not showing people that because, you know, those those five hours or six hours or eight hours, it's like a full-time job being on your phone. Most people aren't forthright with that information. And so we like to hide things. We like to, you know, put, put our best foot forward, so to say, uh, lead with our strengths. And so we want to be seen a certain way. And I, I do that myself. I'll be, I'll be taking a nap. Here, I'm going to expose myself. I'll be taking a nap uh, in my bed, and I can hear my wife coming up. But I'm just resting. I'm not resting my eyes because they're on my phone. And I hear my wife coming up, and I put my phone down. And I, <laughs> I pretend that I'm sleeping <laughs> because I want her to see me a certain way. Because I don't want my phone to be rest time in her sight, in her eyes. And so whether it's I'm hiding my cookie consumption, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hiding my phone consumption. Um, me and my wife share credit cards, so it's super hard to hide. And like I said, she's way smarter than me. So she gets notifications. And then sometimes I spend money on, on a certain item that I play on my phone. And, and sometimes I'll do it right beside her. And then I'll look at her waiting for the notification to happen and laugh. But uh, I used to spend money on certain things that I, I wouldn't want my wife telling on me. Um, it, it's just one of those things where I just don't really want you to know how much I spend on certain activities or, or hobbies or whatever it is. Um, I don't, I don't want you to think something of me that I don't want to be. Um, so, so we can go into this being an actor of like, if you knew the real me, I don't think you would like me and you would probably criticize me and make fun of me and therefore isolate me. And, 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 and you would not choose to be my friend if you really knew the new me. And so I get to be an actor, and, and we see this in, in our recovery literature of this is the real problem. I'm trying to hide myself from you and especially from God because I don't have a relationship with God. I am God. And so I don't do a very good job of it. And out of doing that job and trying to control what you see and don't see and what God sees and don't sees, it's exhausting it's tiring, and I need relief. So I go to the phone, I go to the alcohol, I go to the relationship, 
I go to the job and put in 20 hours a week or, or, or 20 hours a day. And, and I'm over exaggerating doing these things that bring me the sense of relief of ease and comfort. And it gives me breathing room until it tries to choke out my life because it's not real air. It's not real breath because my breath actually comes from God, from Yahweh. And when you say the word Yahweh, you can't help but breathe in Yahweh and breathe out. And he is the breath of life. But I look for this breath everywhere else. And I try to get it because I'm scared of what everybody thinks and the pressure of it causes me not to breathe properly. And I look for the breath in all of these situations, hiding from my true self, because I'm more worried about what you see on the outside than what I'm really all about on the inside. And I use these fig leaves to hide from you and God. And so we look at the narrative of this actor and it says... The first requirement is to be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On this basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Even though my motives are good, I'm still in collision with people because I don't want you to see certain things and I'm hiding things or I'm withholding things. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in their own way. If the arrangements would only stay put, if only the people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, our actor may sometimes be quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But with most human beings, we are most likely to have a variety of traits. What usually happens? The show does not come off very well. We begin to think that life doesn't treat me properly. He decides to exert himself even more. He becomes on the next occasion still more demanding or more gracious, as the case may be. Still, The play does not suit him. Admitting he may somewhat be at fault, he is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pity. What is the basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Is he not the victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? Is it not evident to the rest of the players that these things that he wants and do his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is he not at the best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? So if I'm playing the actor, that means I'm the director and I'm always going to produce confusion and chaos. So I'm the actor, the director, and the producer and the show never goes off well. And out of that, I am hiding. I am full of shame. And, and I think that I'm making these choices. And even though that my motives are good, these aren't really choices because what's happening is that I've lost the power to choose because fear is the rebar of my life. So in this garden that we have all been kicked out of, We don't start in the garden of love, hand in hand with God. We start out of the garden because of the consequences of the first choice that went against God. So here I am on the outside of the garden. My my foundation is full of rebar of fear. And fear isn't necessarily this emotion. It sets me in motion. So enemy is the fear. I have it at the, the core of my being. And I get it through the experiences that I've come in agreement with. I've made vows. And here I am thinking I'm 30, 40, 50 years old making choices. And I haven't made a choice in years. Because fear is a slave driver. Slaves technically don't have choices. They get told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And we are in a delusion. And I can be in a delusion 
that I'm actually making these choices. But these choices that I'm making create more shame, which cause me to hide more. And here I am playing God, isolated from everybody that I care about and love, and I need my solution, which usually ends in alcohol. Whatever that ends in with you. It's it's all the same play. So on page 24 of the big book, it talks about this, this inability to choose. This inability that it will be different this time. That if I just make a different choice, if I just add physical activity in a different relationship, I'll be able to choose differently. And the reality is I got to get beyond. I got to see that I am beyond human aid and that even that my motives are good, my choices are horrible because they're actually not choices. But there's this delusion that some of my choices are good. Like, I think I wore the right clothes today. I made a good choice in that. Because this is where the delusion is, is that it doesn't all add up in my head. But a slave has the choice to get up and go to work. But the reality is he's confined to that slavement, to the, to, to the boundaries of what that slavery looks like. And so I have to get to the point that I have lost and I'm in a mental obsession with a delusion that justifies my behaviors and I'm being controlled. I'm not in control. And I have to fully, in step one, I have to fully concede in my inmost being that I need a relationship with God to solve all of my problems. And so that creates abstinence. I have to I have to concede that I need abstinence from the things that I'm seeking ease and comfort from. And so only through a relationship with God does that cause me not to hide. Does that cause me to to be rid of shame? And so we go through in Life Lab if you've done Life Lab the shame inventory is more about um, re- self-resentment. This is what I've been wearing. This is the shame that I've come under. This is the the names that I've adapted. This is um, me being a slave, and I hide from that because I don't want you to see me as a slave. I don't want you to see me as being controlled by anything, whether it's cookies or my cell phone. So I hide from that because it's shameful. And so it's self-resentment, um, being sore at myself. And so uh, I've I've actually recently done a uh, resentment inventory on myself of like, why can't I, the cause is why can't I continue to uh, work out the way that I would want to work out? Because I, I keep quitting working out <laughs> and I put that down. I don't even like talking about it because I want you to see me in a certain way. Yeah, John Ruby likes working out. I hate working out. Um, and and so, how do I get rid of this um, disability? I guess this internal condition. Well, I think I think empathy um, is a great antidote because shame is inward focus. Um, it it's it's about me. And about me thinking about myself way too much, this inward focus of shame. And so empathy is really drawing my attention outward and then being vulnerable. Um, the most, the most, the strongest courageous people that I've ever seen is, is through vulnerability and empathy because my vulnerability will cause empathy because it builds a line of transmission that I don't have it all figured out. And I want to be doing this, but I'm not doing it. Or I have this weakness inside of me, um, but I don't want it to be there. And and I need the community and I need cheerleaders in my life. And I need to keep working in my relationship with God. So I think in my experience, only God can solve this problem of shame because he's going to give me a new identity. And so I can walk forward and words can be said to me and they're not going to slice me to my heart, to my innermost being, because I've conceded that I don't want to be a slave of fear, that I don't want to be controlled by shame. And I come out from that um, and and 
and I start to build this relationship with God that's laid out through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or Life Lab or however you've done that. Um, and, and then the antidote to that is walk out empathy and vulnerability. And then we get to be part of a beautiful community with a bunch of beautiful cheerleaders um, and, and hopefully that we can hear the truth from each other.